Judy, you joined our family back when I was an early teenager. Been knowing us ever since, and as you watched Tom and I and the diff- Bobby and David and the different ones of us grow up, did it ever question in your mind that we were just out there? I'm not going to ask her to answer that in person. It just probably wouldn't hurt, wouldn't help. But, but anyway, something happened a little bit before you came into the family that I'm going to tell off on myself today, and it, it, it kind of fits the message that I want to talk about today. And I hope you all can chuckle with me just a little bit because my mama loved me anyway. Sandy, you're looking like you're shaking your head. Your mama loves you anyway. Sometimes you question why, right? You do. Donna, did it ever happen to you? Were you just... It happened to me on a lot of times. But anyway, Tom's birthday was coming up. I guess I was probably eight years old, something like that. I didn't have any money, but I wanted to get him a present because that's what brothers do, right? You know, sisters too. Y'all get, want to give somebody a present so you don't want to do something nice. So lo and behold, here comes a thing on the Campbell soup can that there was this little spoon that you could get. It would either be a little boy silver-plated spoon or a little girl silver-plated spoon. And if you had X number of soup can labels and sent them in, they would send you this silver-plated spoon. I can't remember whether it was eight or ten soup labels that we had to have, but as an eight-year-old, not thinking clearly like I should, I went under the cabinet where Mama kept her stuff, and I unwrapped the appropriate number of soup labels so that I could send them in and get Tom this spoon for his birthday. Mother was not pleased because I did not mark the cans. I didn't think beyond myself at that moment other than just getting the little labels that I needed. But he got the spoon, and I asked him about it this week. I told him I was going to tell that story, and, and, and uh, he says, yep, I still got that spoon. I don't know if you use it anymore or not, or is it just a special memento that you have stuck in a cabinet somewhere that every now and then you remember your silly little brother and how he got. So anyway, for the next month or so, except for when Mama was going to do a casserole that had to have a specific soup, we had what's called mystery soups. So whatever the can happened to be that we opened is what we got to eat. <laughs> Didn't matter whether you wanted tomato soup or cream of mushroom. If you opened up, a, if you wanted tomato and you opened up a cream of mushroom, that's what we got. Vice versa. I'm here to tell you that's not the way Jesus operates, folks. He doesn't want us to be guessing with a mystery. He wants us to know what's going on at all times, and that's what we're going to talk about now a little bit, and I'm going to move into it. What exactly does Jesus want from his people? And do we have a clear, clear, concise, honorous path forward? And Carol Blevins, I was going to do this sermon, and she was upset because I didn't get to do it when we were at the park because we had inclement weather. And I told her I'd save it until the next time I spoke, but I guess she's at women's ministry this weekend or somewhere else, and I hope they have a wonderful time. Maybe she can watch this online later and and get it. She said, I'm disappointed because I wanted to hear what you were going to talk about. Genesis chapter 32, and I read this story. If you want to read with me, I'm going to flip to it a little bit. Genesis chapter 32, and I'm going to begin in verse 22. I know that one of my boys read part of this, but I'm going to read just a little bit more. And I appreciate Jacob and Joshua for reading the scripture lesson for me this morning. And I've told the other Jeremy, we have two Jeremys, and I tell the one that's here today, Jeremy Centraki, I said, I want to see our children on the pulpit more often. Is that okay with y'all? I like to see them up here. I want them to read the Bible text, whatever it is that their special talent is or whatever. I like to see our children active. So beginning in verse 22 of chapter 32, And we're talking about Jacob now. And he arose that night and took his two wives and his two female servants and his 11 sons and crossed over the ford of Jabbok 
He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. I cannot imagine laying down to sleep. I know how I get in that zone where I'm going off to la-la land. And all at once being grabbed by a stranger, not knowing what's happening. Can you put yourself in this place for a little bit? Have any of you had big brothers or big sisters or been somewhere where that you were asleep and somebody comes and grabs you in the middle, when you're in the depths of your sleep and takes off and tries to do something with you or to you? We did in 4-H camp a little bit, Tom. I, I'm not going to tell it exactly what I did. It was, it's not nice. But uh, the guy didn't like it, I can assure you. He, he, he was rather PO'd or mad at us or whatever. But anyway, he wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with, jo- with God and with men and have prevailed. How many of you have struggled with God and prevailed? as you're struggling with the things that are happening to you in your personal life. Now I'm going to pause on this a little bit, and and we're going to talk a little bit about Jacob and Esau and what happened to get him into the position he's in, but I want to set the stage with something else a little bit before we get into that part of the story. So we're going to set this for aside for just a little bit. But the question in the back of your mind should be, why... Did Jacob need to fight for his life that night? What happened and why did it get to this point? We're going to get back to that, but I'm going to set the stage for you. But I want to deal with Esau first. See, that's his brother. And I guess we'll start there just a little bit, but I'm not. We read our other text in Acts chapter 16. We'll flip over here to that. And this is a text that you've all heard, and on the face of it, Acts chapter 16, verses 30 and 31, I'm going to read that again. And it starts in the prison where Paul was in prison, and an earthquake hit, and the doors to the prison were opened. And the man that was in charge of the prison was terrified for his life because I'm responsible for these prisoners and if any of them escape, they'll take my life. So suddenly this earthquake hits. He wakes up because he was probably asleep as well. He wakes up and he sees all the doors to the prison open and and. and Paul calls out to him and he says, Sir, we're all still here. We're all still here. None of us have escaped. We're here. It's okay. Don't don't take your life because he was going to fall down on his sword because that's what, well, may as well kill myself before they kill me because I'm fixing to die. And he looks at Paul and he says, Sir, what must I do to be saved? Because he'd been hearing Paul sing all night, I guess, and, and pray, and he'd heard what was going on. And so Paul looked at him and said, Sir, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. See, that's interesting. See, at this very moment, do you think it would have been appropriate to say, Now, I've got 26 lessons for you, and we're going to go through the 26 principles of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and then we'll baptize you, and then you can be saved. No, he didn't have time for that, did he? What about the thief on the cross? He'd probably been mocking Jesus along with the rest of them. And when the thief on the cross heard Jesus turn to John and say, John, take care of my mama. Take care of my mama. 
take care of mama. Don't, don't. It touched the thief on one side of him's heart. And he looked at him and said, sir, when you come into your kingdom, can I have a place there with you? And Jesus gave him assurance that day, that moment, right then. He said, you've got to study 36 lessons or 26 lessons. And it's going to take us about a half a year to get you there. And uh, then, then you'll be acceptable. No, no, no. He said, yeah, today, today I'm assuring you, today you're going to be in paradise with me. Now, surely I say it to you today. See, we get caught up in a lot of things sometimes when the important thing is that we know Jesus Christ. And then as time progresses, if you have time, see, this fellow died immediately that day probably. The soldier then, he took Paul home with him and woke up his family and they, they started praising the Lord and getting to know Jesus a little bit better. He had a little time to spend with him to tell him a little bit more about Jesus. And he liked it a whole lot better what he was hearing. And maybe he got the 26 lessons, I don't know, in time. But he was saved, wasn't he? So I tell you now. So let's go on. There was a word I came across and it that's what, you know, I, I like to get into the dictionary sometimes. And as I was studying a little bit, there was a word I found, that word believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The word believe, well, what exactly does that mean? You know where else that exact same word is found? I'm going to flip over here, Hebrews chapter 11, a text you all know just as well as I do. Let's flip over here to you. I like to read it from the Bible so I say it right. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith, that's the same Greek word, believe it or not. Faith and believe. Did y'all know that? Same exact word. The Greek word for that is P-I-S-T-I-S, pistis. It has four meanings. See, that's the fun part about translations. When they translate from one language to another, sometimes there is not an exact word that fits the new language that they're translating it in. So we have to do a little bit of a digging deeper to get an understanding of what it means. The word pistis in Greek has four words for us here in the English language. Faith, belief, trust, and confidence. That makes it a little bit broader, doesn't it? You all ever considered that? I, I had my epiphany moment when I was t studying this. I said, that makes sense. You know, because when you read some of the text in the Bible, sometimes some of them, they kind of almost like they contradict one another, but they really don't. Well, sometimes you have to go back to the Greek and, see, and realize that the translation is not as good as it could have been or, or there wasn't an exact word or a way in the English language to express what the writer in Hebrew or Aramaic was meaning. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Evidence is another Greek word that y'all need to hear and think about. It's called E-L-E-N-G-C-H-O-S, elengachos, which basically refers to the Holy Spirit which can convince and convict you of the truth moving forward. See, and that's what Jesus knew on the cross See, he's able to make that snap decision about the prisoner that was on the other side of him. He could see the man's heart and recognize that he would be worthwhile to have in heaven and that he could grow and become a better person. But he was going to take all of his sins with him to heaven. He probably hadn't been forgiven of anything that he'd done here on the face of this earth. He was probably a thief, a robber, whatever else you want to say about that fellow. But Jesus saw beyond the physical appearance and looked at his heart and he was able to save him. I guarantee you if you'd have asked any of us to look on that man and what he'd done, none of us would have said he was worth saving. And that's where I'm getting to on this as much as anything else is don't judge anybody else. What does it say? Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be what? White as snow. Why? Why? Because Jesus Christ sees beyond your physical appearance and knows your heart and whether you're the type of person that he can trust 
to let go into heaven because you're the person that can grow. You're the person that has potential. And he says, okay, I see the status of your heart. And it's like Paul, obviously, had, he'd had his experience on the Damascus Road. God gave him a little bit more insight than he did most of us. Paul was able to see the heart of the jailer through the grace of God. And he said, sir, what must we do to be saved? And he said, believe, trust, put your confidence and believe in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That puts a little bit more meaning to it, doesn't it? Just makes it a little bit better in my mind. Anyway, an evidence which is in, well, it said, I already talked about evidence. How about substance? See, faith is the substance. Substance, wow. That word had needed a little bit more work on it too. That's a Greek word too. That's called, where did I put that word in here? I failed to put the Greek in on it, but that's okay. The agreement is, or the substance of it is, is a basis for relationships. So Jesus wants to have a relationship with you and I, and that's what he's after. Are you trustworthy enough for Jesus to have a relationship with you? Now, the beginning of the 20th century, while they were digging up some artifacts in Egypt, they found some old deeds, and that Greek word was on the deeds and business deeds also where they had agreements between parties, and that's what it said. It, that was the basis for you to have a relationship, a working relationship, or it was the basis when you bought a property to know that you now own that piece of property and you have the deed to it and it's your property as long as you pay the taxes on it. See, that's what all of these texts mean. There's a bigger word in here. And it's, take your time, and I want you to go home. Really take your time and study some of this because it will enhance your relationship with Jesus Christ when what he's really wanting is a trustworthy relationship. You know, one of the stories that I read in one of the books, it was uh, by Mac, Maxwell Graham, or no, Arthur Maxwell. You know, Arthur was the one who wrote the Bible stories. Graham, Mas Graham Maxwell wrote another book. He was a uh, theologian. He was the brother. He was a theologian at Loma Linda University of Religion. And if I was reading his story. His comment was he has 150 different versions of the Bible that's been translated. And he says, I spread them out all over the place while I'm studying so that when I'm studying, I can figure out what it is that it means. And a lot of times, what comes across, it gets enhanced by other versions a little bit better. And that's what he was after. He said, sometimes you need to open up your mind just a little bit. It's basically what he's saying. But what Jesus is really after is to us to have a relationship where you're trustworthy enough that he can let you in heaven. Now, those of you that are married here in the, with us and that are listening, how would it work in your relationship with your significant other or your spouse if uh, your mindset on the relationship was, maybe I can cheat just a little bit and it'll be all right and we'll work things out? Would that make for a good marriage, Jimmy? Uh, uh, Sally, you wouldn't put up with that? Not at all. Boy, she's putting it quick on it. Uh, Donna, how would that work out with you, you and Chris? If I, can, if I can cheat just a little bit, it'll still be all right. You know, we'll, we'll work it out. I've been married 40 years. I know what my wife would say. <laughs> it wouldn't work at all in my household. Uh, it, but cheat we do on Jesus on a regular basis, unfortunately, right? But he stands there ready as often as necessary to forgive us and rewrite the relationship and move us forward as long as he sees the status of your heart and he recognizes, I've erred and I don't want to do it again. I'm going to do better. And as you read Patriarchs and Prophets, and that's the book I brought, and that's what I've, the sermon basically is based on chapters 16 through 18. And that's the beauty of this chapter is in me having to delay the sermon on this. Is, uh, as I tell Donna, my sermons are on one page or less, and so most of it's up here. So as I, I read and reread these three chapters for the last month, I got a whole lot more meat out of them. And I probably may wind up doing another sermon on these three chapters before it's over with if I want to. I'll think about it. But there's so much meat in these three chapters. Go home and think about it but, and pray about it. What was the difference between Jacob and Esau? 
let's get back to that now. See, I've already set the stage for what Jesus expects from us and how it works. Let's turn over. We get a, in Genesis, we're told just a little bit about Jacob. I mean, Esau. He was a hunter, strong-willed, mighty warrior, loved to hunt, loved to play, enjoyed life, didn't like to slow down and be told that anything he was doing was right or wrong. And so that's what we're talking about. When you get over about Esau in Hebrews chapter 12, I'm going to read verses 16 and 17. It tells us the character of Esau. And this is why God couldn't work with Esau. And this is the question that I'm going to throw back at you. Can God work with you? Let's look at Esau here and see what God won't put up with. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. He was more interested in the here and the now and what felt good and what he wanted here and now, not looking out for the future of what the promises were from God. So let's move on. For you know that afterwards... When he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. And why was he rejected? For he found no place for repentance. Though he sought it diligently with tears. He sought his inheritance, and he got that, but he didn't get salvation because he didn't think he'd done anything wrong. He was entitled and we, th- we studied this in prayer meeting. Let's flip over to John chapter 8. We went over this, and it really, really struck me and came home. It's, those of you that haven't been coming to prayer meeting, I invite you to because we're really going through the book of John in a deeper, deeper, deeper way, and I'm getting a lot of blessings out of it. it you know, you can study this at home, take your time at home, and read it at yourself at home, but we're blessed for having read these books. And I'm going to start in verse 31. And it's going to take a few texts here to set the stage for what I'm saying. John chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. That's one of my favorite texts. I love that text. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. They answered him, And this is the bad part. I don't like the rest of this. We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say we will truly be made free? Why? Because they had an aura or an arrogance of thinking they were entitled to heaven because of their birthright of whose family they were born into, their father, Abraham. Can I be saved because of what my mama and daddy did? Can anybody else be saved for what their mommy and daddy did? Only you can develop a right relationship with Jesus Christ and become trustworthy enough that he will want to allow you to come into heaven. You're not entitled to anything. What about the fact that I'm the fourth generation, Seventh-day Adventist? Doesn't that stand for something? I never met my great-grandmother, but she was Adventist too. And uh, my grandmother didn't have a car, and they were going to the Methodist church with her little girls because that's how they could walk to the Methodist church. And finally, granddaddy got a car, and she was able to take her three little girls to the Fatherland Street Seventh-day Adventist Church. That was before the other one was built in Nashville. And there was a sweet little girl there that made those three little girls feel welcome. And because this little girl made them feel welcome, they said, Mama, we want to go back. Through the mouth of babes. Children, I'm holding this out to you to let you know that you have a place and a work to do in helping save souls. My whole family is in the Seventh-day Adventist church today because of that one little girl making those three little girls feel welcome and they wanted to come back because Mom and Tina told them, if you don't like it, we don't have to go back. Right. 
This little girl stepped up to the plate and did what needed to be done for these little girls. The Holy Spirit impressed her? I don't know. But Jesus loves my family. But each one of us, Judy, has to make our own decision. You've got four boys. Each of them has to make their own decision for themselves. I don't care how much you pray for your four boys. If they don't have a one-on-one personal commitment and a right relationship developed with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, where will they be? My children, your children, I can pray for them, and I do pray for my children. I pray for all of our children. I pray for our families. But each one of them has to have their own personal right relationship developing with Jesus Christ. And then Jesus answered them, this is verse 34, Most assuredly I say to you, Whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. See, Jesus wants us to be his son. He's calling us in. Therefore, if the son makes you free, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Isn't that what we want, Jesus Christ? And then Jesus went on and put the icing on top of the cake here for him. Verse 39, he says, I know that you're Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. See, when you stand before Jesus on judgment day and Satan comes forward and throws out everything he can at you, about how bad you were and what all you did and the patheticness of your soul. And this guy, he's ridiculous. There's no way. And then Jesus stands up and he says, I look at my book and I don't see a single thing on his page. They're all in my book. His page is clean. And he wraps his robe of righteousness around him and says, Father, this one's mine. Though his sins were scarlet, they're white as snow now. Come on home. Come on in. See, that's the difference. Are you trustworthy enough to be let into heaven? Let's turn to Habakkuk. It's a little old book in the Old Testament. You can find it here. It's kind of hard to find, but I find it right here. Habakkuk. Let me see. I had trouble finding it. Oh, here we go. Just before the little book of Haggai and after the book of Nahum. There, kind of in the tail end of your... Habakkuk's having a conversation with God. This is a good book to read, so take your time. Take this book home, too, and read it, too. It, you can't get enough out of this, a lot of the stories here. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5 is what uh, is going on here. Some crazy things have happened, and Habakkuk's having a little bit of trouble with it. Look among the nations and watch, is what God tells him. Be utterly astounded, Ernest, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told you. Our Sabbath school lesson this morning with Mike, I sat in with the youth class this morning. They talked about, we talked about the 500 years from the time that the children of Israel went into captivity until they were back into the promised land. That's beyond our comprehension. So God works in timelines that are somewhat different than what we're used to. So let's move over to chapter 2 now, and we'll continue our thought here. Chapter 2, beginning in verse 2. Then the Lord answered me and said... Write the vision that I've given you and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. In other words, it's not for today. But it's going to come. What I'm telling you is going to happen. But at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it. Wait for it. Because it will surely come and it will not tarry when it does. See, God's on a different timeline than you and I are. We're impatient. We expect things to happen right now. Oh, yeah, right now. I don't want to wait. But God's telling us, let's wait upon the Lord. He's given us all kinds of instructions, all kinds of clues. He's told us, Somewhat of the timeline that's going to happen, but of course none of us know the day or the hour of his coming, but we see the signs, don't we? We're seeing the signs. And we want to get ready for what? 
for when Jesus comes so that when he calls, when that trumpet blasts, that he's going to call me. See, David in the Old Testament, and you know when you read the story of David, there's not a one of us here that would say David's worthy of being a child of God. When you look at some of the stunts David did. But Samuel, the prophet, was told to go talk to David and reveal to him that God knows about your sin, son. And it's uh, between you and Bathsheba. And he did it in such a way that it touched David's heart. And after he had his heart touched, this is in Psalms 51, and I'm going to pick up and read in verse 6. David, this is the difference in David and some of the others, especially in Esau. See, Esau hardened his heart. David recognized he was a sinner. And here, beginning in verse 6, he says, Behold, you desire the truth in your inward parts, and in your inward part, hidden part, you will make make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop. In other words, clean me out, Lord. Clean me. And I shall be clean. He couldn't do it himself, could he? Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Who can wash us and make us whiter than snow? Jesus Christ. He's the only one. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. See, that's what Jesus is willing to do to each one of us. If you have a contrite heart. If you're willing to acknowledge that you're a sinner in need of a Savior, Jesus can work with you and for you and through you. But if you harden your heart as Esau, there's nothing he can do. Keep on going. Verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. And then I want to drop down to verses 16 and 17. And this is what really is is the icing on the cake here. See, God, I don't desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God or a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. See, that's what Jesus wants. He wants you to be somebody that he can work with, somebody that has his heart in the right direction, that can recognize, I'm a sinner, unfit for salvation, but Jesus, thank you because you love me anyway. You love me anyway. I'm going to hammer that one in just a little bit more. Flip over to Hosea. Go and find Hosea and put up with me. I'm reading a lot of Bible texts today, and I probably could get by with reading a little bit less, but these texts are all so important. And if I can find Hosea, it's in here somewhere. Yeah, there it is. Oh, I just flipped past it. Anyway, Hosea chapter 2, verse 4, and I I wrote it down, but y'all can read it in your Bibles in the New English Version or the King James Version, but according to Graham Maxwell, he likes the Phillips Version on this text, so I'm going to read it to you out of the Phillips rather than King James. It is true love that I have wanted, not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. See, the children of Israel had gotten to the point where I can go do what I want to do and all i got to do is come up, make an offering and burn the, burn the sin offering and it'll be okay, right? Is that what this purpose of the burnt offerings was? It was never. As you kill the, off, the, the, the slay the lamb or the bull or the turtle dove or whatever and the blood is shed, we're supposed to recognize that it's because of my sin and my transgression that death has occurred and I'm so sorry. It's not that you're sacrificing something to make up for it. See, if you do it, if that's what it's all about, you're buying your salvation. 
you know. Y'all saw you've sinned, you come to the confessional, you've sinned, you've done this, you've done that. Put X number of dollars in the offering plate and say 10 Hail Marys and everything's A-OK. Go back tomorrow and do it again. We'll get 10 more dollars out of you and you can get to say a few more Hail Marys. Is that what God wants? No. He wants a contrite heart. He wants a change in spirit, a change in attitude, an acceptance that I am a sinner unfit for salvation, but because Jesus loves me anyway, I have hope. I have hope. See, faith implies an attitude towards God of love, trust, and the deepest admiration. Now, I told you we'd get back to uh, Jacob, and that's where we're headed now. And uh, we're not told in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy or anywhere else why Jacob and his mama decided to take it upon their own hands to work out the birthright. See, God told Jacob's mama, the older would serve the younger, and that meant the birthright, right? But as, 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 as his dad got to the point of death, he decided he was going to bestow the birthright on Esau anyway, contrary to what God had said. And so Mama and Jacob took it upon themselves to deceive poor old dad. Did it go very well for him? What is it we've been saying here in these earlier texts? Wait upon the Lord. He's got it. He's got it. You don't, have to, you don't have to get in God's business. If God says it, he's going to do it. But he didn't get the opportunity here because Jacob and his mama got carried away and deceived daddy. And because of this, Jacob had to run like mad and go to a foreign land. But he did meet his mother's people over there, and he, he wound up falling in love with this beautiful girl that was at the well. But more deceptions came his way, Right? So he worked seven years for the beautiful girl of his desires, and then Laban cheated. So he had to work seven more years for the girl of his love. And because he was there, and because his spirit was right, the Lord blessed him anyway in this foreign land. And no matter what he did, God blessed him, and things prospered in his hand to the point of where Laban became jealous of Jacob. And as this happened... God came back to Jacob just like he did when he slept on the rock overnight when he saw Jacob's ladder that took place. He said, don't worry, I got you. I still love you. I forgive you. You're in charge. It's time for you to go back home now. He wasn't able or he didn't think he was able to talk to Laban and say, let me go. He took off when Laban was out of town for a little bit somewhere. And he took off with all his herds and his flocks, his wives and his children, and they took off boot scoot boogie, as you want to call it, going towards his home ancestral lands. And poor old Laban, when he found out what happened, he was mad. And he decided that I'm going to go get him. And he took off and went after him for all he was worth. And if it hadn't been for the intervention of the Lord, Laban would have probably killed him. But in a dream... Before he got to Jacob, the Lord told him, leave that boy alone. He's mine. Leave that boy alone. So they came together, and Jacob and his father-in-law had a feast, and they built a pile of stones there. And Laban said, I'll not cross this pile of stones coming towards you if you promise not to cross this pile of stones going back to my land. So that's the last we have of hearing about Laban and his group in the Bible. So they head on, and it says there that as they were traveling, it felt like angels escorted them as they traveled, like a band of angels in front and a band of angels behind, guiding and directing their paths and protecting them as they traveled to the homeland. Jacob saw this and recognized it and, and praised God for it, And as he was getting close to home, all of his past started building up in his mind, and he started saying, I don't know, I don't know, I'm afraid. You know, however, God had already told him when he put his head on the rock, I got you. He intervened with Laban and said, I've got you. He sent a group of angels 
to protect them as they traveled, telling him, I got you. And here's Jacob, still shaking in his boots, trying to figure out what I'm going to do to appease my brother because he sent some gifts to his brother, and his brother rejected the gifts, and he had 300 men of war on the way to come wipe out out Jacob and his family and steal their stuff. And Jacob was terrified. Jacob was terrified. He did all he could do in his own power, but it wasn't enough. And so the night before, Esau and this band of marauders were to get to him. God wrestled with Jacob, and another angel went and dealt with Esau. Folks, God's in charge. Our job is to not take it upon ourselves to get into God's business, but to allow God to work in us and through us and accept the workings of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in our lives. So that night, during his night of wrestling, God said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. And he only had 11 children then, but he did have another one later called Benjamin. And I'm going to tell you something else in my mind. As I read the stories here, I can assure you that I would not have chosen these 12 people to be the names of the tribes that represented me. They were flawed people. Oh, wait a minute. We're flawed too, aren't we? We're flawed too. So God worked through them anyway, didn't he? See, God's in charge. Here it is. Salvation is the gift of God to the repentant. That's my point. Salvation is the gift of God to the repentant. Satan wants you to think you're unworthy and to do nothing. But God calls us to use a little self-control and to hold back on what we're wanting to do and what we think we need to do And allow God to lead in us and through us so that we can reach out to those around us. I'm going to end with this thought right here. Romans 6, 23. Y'all can quote it with me if you want to. The wages of sin are what? Death. But the gift of God. Did anybody earn a gift? The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Look at the story of Esau and Jacob and Laban and some of these others and recognize how God worked with and for them and he will work with and for us as well. Let us pray. Father, thank you so very much for the lessons that we get from history. Help us to appreciate how you work in our lives through us and for us. Be with us as we go through the rest of the Sabbath today. May we be blessed for having spent time with you. For be thy will. Amen.